Page 68, Chapter 18. In what mode faith should be kept by princes? How praiseworthy it is for a prince to keep his faith, to live with honesty and not by astuteness. Everyone understands. Nonetheless, one sees by experience in our own times that the princes who have done great things, who have done great things, are those who have taken little account of faith and have known how to get around men's brains with their astuteness, and in the end they have overcome those who have founded themselves on loyalty. Thus, you must know that there are two kinds of combat, one with laws, the other with force. The first is proper to man, the second to beast. But because the first is often not enough, one must have recourse to the second. Therefore, it is necessary for a prince to know well how to use the beast and the man. This role was taught covertly by princes, by ancient writers. Taught covertly to princes by ancient writers who wrote that Achilles and many other ancient princes who were given to Chiron, the centaur, to be raised so that he would look after them with his discipline. Achilles, Chiron, the centaur, to have a teacher. To have as teacher a half-beast, half-man means nothing other than that a prince needs to know how to use both natures, and the one without the other is not lasting. Thus, since a prince is compelled of necessity to know, well, how to use the beast, he should pick the fox and the lion, because the lion does not defend itself from snares, and the fox does not defend itself from wolves. So one needs to be a fox to recognize snares and a lion to frighten the wolves. Those who stay simply with the lion do not understand this. A prudent lord, therefore, cannot observe faith. Nor should he, when such observance turns against him and the causes that made him promise have been eliminated. And if all men were good, this teaching would not be good, because, but because they are wicked and do not observe faith with you, you also do not have to observe it with them. Nor does a prince ever lack legitimate causes to color his failure to observe faith. One could give infinite modern examples of this and show how many peace treaties and promises have been rendered invalid and vain through the infidelity of princes, and the one who has known best how to use the fox has come out best. But is it is necessary to know, well, how to color this nature and to be a great pretender and dissembler. And men are so simple and so obedient to present necessities that he who deceives will always find someone who will let himself be deceived. I do not want to be silent about one of the recent examples. Alexander the Sixth never did anything, not ever thought of anything but how to deceive men, and he always found a subject to whom he could do it. And there never was a man with greater efficacy in a certain thing and in affirming it with greater oaths who observed it less. Nonetheless, his deceit succeeded at his will because he well knew this aspect of the world. Thus, it is not necessary for a prince to have all the above-mentioned qualities, in fact, but it is indeed necessary to appear to have them. Nay, I dare say this, that by having them and always observing them, they are harmful, and by appearing to have them, they are useful, as it is to appear merciful, faithful, humane, honest, and religious and to be so, but to remain with the spirit built so that if you need not to be those things, you are able to know how to change to the contrary. This has to be understood, that a prince, and especially a new prince, cannot observe all those things for which men are held good, since he is often under a necessity to maintain his state of acting against faith, against charity, against humanity, against religion. And so he needs to have a spirit deposed. A spirit disposed, disposed to change as the winds of fortune, and variations of things command him, and as I said above, not depart from good when possible, but know how to enter into evil when forced by necessity. A prince should thus take great care that nothing escape his mouth that is not full of the above mentioned five qualities, and that to see him and hear him he should appear all mercy, all faith, all honesty, all humanity, all religion. And nothing is more necessary to appear to have than this. Last quality, men in general judge more by their eyes than by their hands, because seeing is given to everyone, touching to few. Everyone sees how you appear, few touch what you are, and these few dare not oppose the opinion of many, 
who have the majesty of the state to defend them, and in the actions of all men, and especially of princes, where there is no court to appeal to, one looks to the end. So let a prince win and maintain his state. The means will always be judged honorable and will be praised by everyone. For the vulgar are taken in by the appearance and the outcome of a thing, and in the world there is no one but the vulgar. The few have a place there when the many have somewhere to lean on. A certain prince of present times, whom it is not well to name, never preaches anything but peace and faith, and is very hostile to both. If he had observed both, he would have either he would have had either his reputation or his state taken from him many times. One manuscript says the few have no place there, dot, 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 and the authorities have divided Casella, Russo, and Sasso, except in no place, Chibold and Bertelli, a place. Okay. Chapter 19, of avoiding contempt and hatred. But because I have spoken of the most important of the qualities mentioned above, I want to discourse on the others briefly under this generality that the prince, as was said above in part, should think how to avoid those things that make him hateful and contemptible. When he avoids them, he will have done his part and will find no danger in, in his other infamies. What makes him hated above all, as I said, is to be rapacious and an usurper of the property and the women of his subjects. From these he must abstain. And whenever one does not take away either property or honor from the generality of men, they live content. And one has only to combat the ambition of the few, which may be checked in many modes. And with ease, what makes him contemptible is to be held variable, light, effeminate, pusillanimous, irresolute, from which a, pr a prince should guard himself as from a soul. He should contrive that greatness, spiritness, gravity, and strength are recognized in his actions, and he should insist that his judgments in the private concerns of his subjects be irrevocable. And he should maintain such an opinion of himself that no one thinks either of deceiving him or of getting around him. The prince who gives his opinion, the prince who gives this opinion of himself is highly reputed, and against whoever is reputed, it is difficult to conspire, difficult to mount an attack, provided it is understood that he is excellent and revered by his own subjects. For a prince should have two fears, one within on account of his subjects, the other outside on account of external powers. From the latter, one is defended with good arms and good friends. And if one has good arms, one will always have good friends. And things inside will always remain steady if things outside are steady, unless indeed they are disturbed by a conspiracy. And even if things outside are in motion, provided he has ordered and lived as I said, as long as he does not forsake himself, he will always withstand every thrust, as I said, nabis, nabis, the Spartan did. Hey! As I say, Nabus the Spartan did. But as to subjects, when things outside are not moving, one has to fear that they may be conspiring secretly from this. The prince may secure himself sufficient, sufficiently if he avoids being hated or despised and keeps the people satisfied with him. This is necessary to achieve as was said above at length, and one of the most powerful remedies that a prince has against conspiracies is not to be hated by the people generally. For whoever conspires always believes he will satisfy the people with the death of the prince, but when he believes he will offend them, he does not get up the spirit to adopt such a course because the difficulties on the side of the conspirators are infinite. And one sees from experience that there have been many conspiracies, but few have had a good end. For whoever conspires cannot be alone, but... He cannot find company except those he believes to be malcontents, and as soon as you disclose your intent to a malcontent, you give him the matter with which to become content, because manifestly he can hope for every advantage from it. So seeing sure gain on this side, and on the other dubious gain full of danger, he must indeed either be a rare friend or an altogether obstinate enemy of the prince to observe his faith with you, and to reduce this to brief terms, I say that on the part of the conspirator, there is nothing but fear, jealousy, and the anticipation of terrifying punishment, but on the part of the prince, there is the ma majesty of the principality, the laws, the protection of friends, and of the state, which defend him, so that when popular goodwill is added to all these things, it is impossible that anyone should be so rash 
as to conspire for whereas a conspirator ordinarily has to fear before the execution of the evil, in this case having the people as enemies, he must fear afterwards too when the excess has occurred, nor can he hope for any refuge. It's a long chapter. Probably should have looked into that before I start reading it. One might give infinite examples of this matter, but I wish to be content with only one that happened within the memory of our fathers, Messer Annabelle, Annabelle Bent, Bentivoglio, grandfather of the present, Messer Annabelle, who, Bale, I don't know, who was Prince in Bologna, was killed by the canon. Kineshi conspiring against him, and no one survived him but Messer Giovanni, who was in swaddling clothes. Immediately, immediately after that homicide, the people rose up and killed all the Kineshi. This came from the particular, from the popular goodwill the house of Benti Voglio had in those times, which is so great that since there remained no one of that house in Bologna who could rule that state, Annabelle being dead, and since there is indication that in Florence someone had been born of the Bent E. Vogli, who was considered until then the son of a blacksmith, the Bolognese, the Bolognese, people from Bologna, came to Florence for him and gave him the government of their city, which was governed by him until Messer Giovanni reached an age suitable for governing. I conclude, therefore, that a prince should take little account of conspir conspiracies that the people show goodwill to him, but if they are hostile and bear, bear hatred for him, he should fear everything and everyone. And well-ordered states and wise princes have thought out with all diligence how not to make the great desperate and how to satisfy the people and keep them content, because this is one of the most important matters that concern a prince. Among the well-ordered and governed kingdoms in our times is that of France, and in it are infinite good institutions on which the liberty and security of the king depend. The first of these is the parliament and its authority from for the one who ordered that kingdom, knowing the ambition of the powerful and their insolence, and judging it necessary for them to have a bit in their mouths to correct them. And on the other side, knowing the hatred of the generality of people against the great, which is founded in its fear, and wanted to secure them, intended not intended this not to be the particular concern of the king, so as to take from him the blame he would have from the great when he favored the popular side, and from the popular side when he favored the great, and so he constituted a third judge to be the one who would beat down the great and favor the lesser side without blame for the king. This order could not be better or more prudent or a greater cause of the security of the king and the kingdom. From this one can infer another notable thing, that princes should have anything blamable administered by others, favors by themselves. Again, I conclude that a prince should esteem the great, but not make himself hated by the people. It might perhaps appear to many, considering the life and death of some Roman emperor, that there were examples contrary to my opinion, since one may find someone who has always lived excellently, excellently and shown great virtue of spirit, and has nonetheless lost the empire, or indeed being killed by his own subjects who conspired against him. Since I want, therefore, to respond to these objections, I shall discuss the qualities of the qualities of certain emperors shown the causes of the ruin to be not unlike that which I have advanced, and in part I shall offer for consideration things that are notable for whoever reads about the actions of those times. And I want it to suffice for me to take all the emperors who succeeded to the empire, from Marcus the philosopher to Maximinus. These were Marcus, Commodus, his son, Pertinax, Julia, Julianus, Severus, his son, Anton, Antonus, Antoninus, Caracalla, Macrinus, Heliogabalus, Alexander, Alexander Severus, and Maximus. And first it is to be noted that whereas in other principalities one has to contend only with the ambition of the great and the insolence of the people, the Roman emperors had a third difficulty of having to bear with the cruelty and uh, avarice the greed of their soldiers. This was so difficult the, that it was the cause of the ruin of many, since it was difficult to satisfy the soldiers and the people, for the people loved quiet and therefore loved modest princes, and the soldiers loved the prince with a military spirit who was insolent, cruel, and rapacious. They wanted him to practice these things on the people so that they could double their pay and give vent to their avarice and cruelty. Greed. These things always brought about the ruin of those emperors who by nature or by art did not have a great reputation such that they could hold both in check, and most of them, especially those who came to the Principate as new men, 
Once they recognized the difficulty of these two diverse humors, turned to satisfying the soldiers, caring little about injuring the people. This course was necessary, for since princes cannot fail to be hated by someone, they are at first forced not to be hated by the people generally, and when they cannot continue this, they have to contrive with all industry to avoid the hatred of those communities which are most powerful. And so those emperors who, because they were new, had need of extraordinary support, stuck to the soldiers rather than the people, which nonetheless turned out useful for them and not according to whether the prince knew how to keep himself in repute. With them from the causes mentioned above, Marcus, Pertinax, Pertinax, and Alexander, all living a modest life, lovers of justice, enemies of cruelty, humane and kind, all except for Marcus, came to a bad end. Only Marcus lived and died most honorably, because he succeeded to the empire by hereditary right and did not have to acknowledge it as from either the soldiers or the people, then since he was attended with many virtues that made him venerable, while he lived he always kept the one order and the other within its bounds and was neither was never either hated or despised. But Pertinax, Pertinax was created emperor against the will of the soldiers who, since they were used to living in license under Commodus, could not tolerate the decent life to which Pertinax wanted to return them, hence having created hatred for himself, and to this hatred added disdain. Since he was old, he was ruined in the first beginnings of his administration. And here one should note that hatred is acquired through good deeds as well as bad deeds. And so, as I said above, a prince who wants to maintain his state is often forced not to be good, for when that community of which you judge... You have need to maintain yourself as corrupt, whether they are the people, the soldiers, or the great. You must follow their humor to satisfy them, and then good deeds are your enemy. But let us come to Alexander. He was of such goodness that among the other praise attributed to him is this, that in the 14 years he held the empire, no one was ever put to death by him without a trial. Nonetheless, since he was held to be effeminate and a man who let himself be governed by his mother, and for this came to be despised, the army conspired against him and killed him. Reviewing now, by contrast, the qualities of Commodus, of Severus, Antoninus, Caracalla, and Maximus, you will find them very cruel and very rapacious. To satisfy the soldiers, they would not spare any kind of injury that could be inflicted on the people, and all except Severus came to a very bad end. For in Severus was so much virtue that by keeping the soldiers his friends, although the people were overburdened by him, he was always able to rule happily because his virtues made him so admirable in the sight of the soldiers and the people that the latter remained somehow astonished and stupefied while the former were reverent and satisfied. And because the actions of this great man were great and notable in a new prince, I want to show briefly how well he knew how to use the persons of the fox and the lion, whose natures, I say above, are necessary for a prince to imitate. Since Severus knew the indolence of Emperor Julianus, he persuaded his army, of which he was captain in Slavonia, that it would be good to go to Rome and avenge the death of Pertinax, Pertinax, who had been put to death by the Praetorian soldiers under this pretext, Without showing that he aspired to the empire, he moved his army against Rome, and he was in Italy before his departure was known. When he arrived at when he arrived at Rome, he was elected emperor by the Senate out of fear, and Julianus put to death. After this beginning, there remained two difficulties for Severus. If he wanted to become lord of the whole state, one in Asia, where Pescinius Niger, the head of the Asian armies had himself called emperor, and the other in the west where Albinus also aspired to the empire, and because he judged it dangerous to disclose himself as an enemy to both, he decided to attack Niger and deceive Albinus. To Albinus he wrote that since he had been elected emperor by the Senate, he wanted to share that dignity with him. He sent him the title Caesar, and by decision of the Senate, accept him as a colleague. These things were accepted by Albinus as true. But after Severus had defeated Niger, put him to death, and brought peace to, to affairs in the east, he returned to Rome and complained in the Senate that Albinus, hardly grateful for the benefits he had received from him, had perfidiously sought to kill him, and for this it was necessary for Severus to go punish his ingratitude. Then he went to meet him in France and took from him his state and his life. Thus, whoever examines minutely the actions of this man will find him a very fierce lion, very astute fox, 
We'll see that he was feared and revered by everyone and not hated by the army and will not marvel that he, a new man, could have held so much power. For his very great reputation always defended him from the hatred that the people could have conceived for him because of his robberies. But his son, Anti Antoninus, 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 Caracalla, was himself a man who had most excellent parts that made him marvelous in the sight of the people and pleasing to the soldiers. For he is a military man, very capable of enduring every trouble, disdainful of all delicate food and of all other softness, which made him loved by all the armies. Nonetheless, his ferocity and cruelty were so great, so unheard of, for after infinite individual killings, he had to be put to death. The, a great part of the people of Rome and all the people of Alexandria, that he became most hateful to all the world. He began to be feared even by those whom he had around him, so that he was killed by a centurion in the midst of his army. Here it is, it is to be noted that deaths such as these, which fall from the decision of an obstinate spirit, can not be avoided by princes, because anyone who does not care about death can hurt him. But the prince may well fear them less because they are very rare. He should only guard against doing grave injury to any one of those whom he uses and has around him in the service of his principality. As Antoninus, Antoninus had done, he had, been, he had put to death with disgrace the brother of that centurion and threatened him every day, yet he kept him in his bodyguard, which was a rash policy likely to bring ruin as happened to him, but let us come to Commodus, who held the empire with great ease because he had it by hereditary right, being the son of Marcus. It was enough for him only to follow in the footsteps of his father, and he would have satisfied both the soldiers and the people. But since he had a cruel and bestial spirit so as to practice his rapacity on the people, he turned to indulging the armies and making them licentious. On the other hand, by not keeping his dignity, by descending often into theaters to fight with gladiators, and by doing other very base things hardly deserving of the impartial m majesty, he became contemptible in the sight of the soldiers, and since he was hated on one side and despised on the other, he was conspired against and put to death. It remains now to tell the qualities of Maximinius. He was a very warlike man, and since the armies were disgusted with the softness of Alexander, whom I discussed above, when he was put to death, they elected Maximinius to, to the empire. He did not possess it for long, because two things made him hated and contemptible. One was being of very base origin, because he had formerly herded sheep in Thrace, which was very well known everywhere and brought great disdain for him in the sight of everyone. The other was that because at the start of his principality, he had deferred going to Rome and taken possession of the imperial throne, he had established an opinion of himself as very cruel, since he had committed many cruelties through his prefects in Rome and everywhere in the empire. So since the whole world was excited by indignation at the baseness of his blood and by hatred arising from fear of his ferocity, Africa rebelled first, then the Senate with all the people of Rome and all Italy conspired against him. These were joined by his own army, which, while besieging Aquileia, and finding difficulty in capturing it, became disgusted with this cruelty and fearing him less because it's, it saw he had so many enemies, it killed him. I do not want to reason about either Heliogabalus or Macrinus or Julianus. they were altogether contemptible or immediately eliminated, but I shall come to the conclusion of this discourse. I say that the princes of our times have less of this difficulty of satisfying the soldiers by extraordinary means in their governments. For notwithstanding that one has to show them some consideration, yet this is quickly settled because none of these princes has armies joined together which are entrenched in the government and administration of provinces as were the armies of the Roman Empire. And so if at that time it was necessary to satisfy the soldiers rather than the people, it was because the soldiers could do more than the people. Now, it is necessary for all princes except the Turk and the Sultan to satisfy the people rather than the soldiers because the people could do more than the soldiers. I accept the Turk from this 
since he always keeps around him 12,000 infantry and 15,000 horse on whom the security and strength of his kingdom depend. And it is necessary for that Lord to put off every other regard and keep them as and keep them his friends. Similarly, since the kingdom of the sultan is in the hands of the soldiers, he is also required to keep them his friends without respect for the people. And you have to note that the sultan's state is formed unlike all other principalities because it is similar to the Christian pontificate, which cannot be called either a hereditary principality or a new principality, for it is not the sons of the old prince who are the heirs and become, become the lords, but the one who is elected to that rank by those who have the authority for it, and this being an ancient order, one cannot call it a new principality because some of the difficulties in new principalities are not in it. For if the prince is indeed new, the orders of that state are old and are ordered to receive him as if he were the hereditary lord. But let us return to our matter. I say that whoever considers the discourse written above will see that either hatred or disdain has been the cause of the ruin of the emperor's name before and we'll also know whence it arises that though some of the, them proceeded in one mode and some in the contrary mode, in whichever mode one of them came to a happy end and the others to unhappy ends, for to Pertinax and Alexander, because they were new princes, it was useless and harmful to wish to imitate Marcus, who is in the Principate by hereditary right, and similarly for Caracalla, Commodus, and Maximinus. Maximinus, it was a pernicious thing to imitate Severus, because they did not have as much virtue as would allow them to follow in his footsteps. Therefore, a new prince in a new principality cannot imitate the actions of Marcus, nor again it is necessary to follow the serfs of those of Severus, but he should take from Severus those parts which are necessary to found his state, and from Marcus those which are fitting and glorious to conserve a state that is already established and firm. That's the end of chapter 19, page 82. Next, chapter 20, whether fortresses and many other things which are made and done by princes every day are useful or useless. Page 83. Coming up in just a second.